Hi, I'm Tim Lynch. I'm a media librarian at the Morristown and Morris Township Library in New Jersey. I have been volunteered to make a video displaying hidden talents, and my college degree is in fine arts. I went to the School of Visual Arts in New York, and I studied painting. One of the things we did with our studies is copy old master paintings. So I've done two previous tutorial videos on copying a Rembrandt painting. Uh, I'm sorry, and my apologies, I've lost the original audio for this video, so I have to do it as a voiceover. But the uh, artist I've chosen as a victim this time is the great French painter Ang. That's I-N-G-R-E-S. You have to get a little sort of guttural sound and to get that French sound, Ang. <laughs> But he was a great painter of the 1800s, and while he painted scenes of religion and history and mythology, it is today, in the 21st century, that his most prized works are his portraits, especially uh, of society ladies in the upper classes in Europe. And they are works of great beauty and charm and skill, and he was a master technician. He did some really, really beautiful things. And and the painting I've chosen for us is uh, one of his best-known yeah. paintings uh, and is of a high-born woman uh, named Louise de Broglier, this charming young lady here. Uh, but she was of a high-born family, and her married name was the Comtesse d'Ossonville. And it is her portrait we are going to try and make a copy of. Uh, since she actually studied piano with the great composer Chopin, we'll use his music as a background. Now we're going to show you some preparation work. Uh, this is going to be a smooth, precise painting. I want a smooth, flat surface, so I'm going to be using plywood, which doesn't have much tooth on my canvas. I'm establishing uh, my borders now with masking tape. I have to speed this up for time. I wish I could go this fast. That's acrylic gesso. And using acrylic gesso thin with water, I'm going to spread that on the surface of uh, the wood. Slopping several coats on that will give us a nice smooth flat ground to work with. Now an important um, part of this um, painting is it's going to be done in two stages. The first stage is going to be using the grisaille technique, which is a painting made entirely in shades of gray and black. This is an ancient technique goes back to the Middle Ages and to the Renaissance, and artists use it to uh, imitate sculptures, or they use it as a foundation for their paintings and then would later add uh, transparent glazes of color, which would give the paint a sort of cool, precise, jewel-like quality. That's what we're going to use now. Now, for my grays, I'm going to use uh, three colors, uh, titanium white, which is a sharp, clean white. I'm going to use Mars black, which is sort of like a metallic cool black derived from iron oxide, and ivory black, which is derived from charcoal, and that it has sort of warmth quality, and I'm going to use those to mix my um, different types of gray. And uh, now here I am mixing that gray. Whoosh, look at me go. Wish I could go paint that fast, but using water and adding the, the blacks and the whites to create a medium tone gray not too dark and not too light uh, just a medium flat area our image and Ang like many artists of the past would take their uh, preliminary drawings and draw a grid on it to transfer their image onto another surface but using 20th century technology I have a transparent plastic grid that students use for their math projects and it does a very nice job of imposing a grid onto a reproduction like so now using another miracle of 20th century technology I'm, I'm going to use a photocopier to make a gridded copy of our lady now I'm going to make a grid on our panel using a large ruler and orange chalk so it will stand out and you've got now a gridded uh, field to work on. I'm afraid we're going to have to do a little math now to get to understand an accurate ratio of what we're doing. You can freeze this frame to uh, explain it but basically our uh, painting is three times larger than the photocopy we're using 
and the painting that we're making is uh, about 60% the size of the original painting. Sorry about that math there. Now, now comes the uh, fun part where we can actually start drawing the picture and by counting out the squares from our photocopy and putting lines in the matching equivalent squares on the panel we are able to make a drawing of Our Lady. I prefer, as a rule, doing freehand drawing for my pictures, but for instructional purposes and to, de um, to demonstrate how to transfer a picture and because the picture is so precise and detailed, you don't want to get too loosey-goosey in the making of it, uh, the grid method is really useful. Now, uh, let's draw for a while. I use soft vine charcoal, which is very soft and easy to correct. You can erase it when um, pretty easily just by rubbing it. Uh, now we have the woman's uh, image of her figure, and we can start uh, adding some of the background uh, details to it. Um, uh, the elements of the mirror and the mantle she's leaning on, the wall panels, the vase and various knickknacks uh, and charge. This dress um, that the uh, countess, uh, I'm going to call her countess, uh, wears is um, very complicated in the painting. It has a life force all its own, it seems. So it's a, it's a, going to be a challenge to uh, render that in the picture. Now, uh, going to uh, using the grid again, uh, try drawing the reflection in the mirror. Uh, Ang used the reflection in the mirror as a clever device uh, that because we get to see not only the front of uh, the Countess, we also get to see the back of her. And uh, it balances out the arrangement of forms in the picture, what, what they call the composition. And it gives it uh, some more visual information and uh, interest about her. Now we're going to make an attempt to um, give her a face. Uh, and uh, using the grid to help uh, establish where the um, nose and the eyes and the mouth are, I'm not going to worry about giving making a close likeness right now, just trying to get those elements of the face on and later on I will uh, worry about giving her a more accurate likeness and fuss over the details. So we can start adding our uh, colors, our paint, uh, or color being gray, actually. Uh, and um, when you're painting, have a care. Don't uh, rest your hand on the uh, picture like I just did and smudge your charcoal. As I said, the uh, advantage to charcoal is it's easy to erase. The disadvantage is that it's easy to erase and you can lose your work. So again, uh, be... Uh, eh. Have to be a bit careful there, but um, now we're adding uh, whites and light grays and beginning to give her more form in her skin and her hair and the details on her dress. We're correcting the drawing, refining it, um, and adding values. And Finding details and smoothing things out as we go along, uh, taking thing, taking away stuff, uh, adding stuff. Working on her hands and arms now. Uh, they actually may seem a little over plump, a little strange, but they are strange in the original painting. Uh, Ang, as an artist, at first glance seems to be very, very realistic, but as you closer examine, 
his work, you can see that he exaggerated and twisted reality to meet his purposes. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, but he twisted anatomy and perspective uh, to, to meet his ends and his tastes. Yeah. Adding wider areas and grayer areas. The working in layers gives the work more of a feeling of volume rather than a flat feeling. We're trying to aim for that. Now, now we can begin working more on uh, uh, the dress right now. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, this dress is the, maybe the one element that gave me the most nightmares because it's of its complexity of folds within folds within folds. It's a real challenge. So at this initial stage, we just want to establish the major folds and wrinkles, the major hills and valleys, as it were, uh, and devoted a lot of attention to this content, to the Contessa's dress. And you want to have all those details but you also don't want to lose the overall solid form. So you just want to get the ridges, the, the light areas and the dark areas. Now over in the corner, there it's cut off, cropped um, by the composition, but that is an upholstered chair. The darker areas of it is a shawl draped over the chair. Uh, Our Lady is perhaps ready to go out for the evening or just come back from the evening. And no 19th century house would be complete without a gas lamp to light the house. Occasionally these things were dangerous. Now magically we are in the outdoor, great outdoors again and going to start adding darker areas. Uh, that dark area of the mirror behind her head. Uh, she, her figure is more well defined but the reflection is going to be fuzzier and looser and maybe a little more mysterious even. Uh, and the back of her head, we can see that she had long hair that is spiraled around and around and tied up with a comb, possibly tortoise shell, and with a ribbon. Well, there I am again. Hi, Mom. And I'm going to add now uh, another layer of darkness in the mirror area. Uh, dark areas that are meant to depict space are often not just flat areas of a single-minded color, but are built up of flares with, of light and dark uh, patches that are vying for attention and gives it a depth and a sense of space. But the walls and the molding areas are closer and more solid and can be done in a flatter, um, more direct manner. Now, if it's possible, if you can see your picture from a distance, you can get a better sense of it. Uh, here it is out in the wild. Perhaps we can sneak up on it unawares and compare it to our photocopy. And I think that we're heading, I think we're heading in the right direction. Uh, we have a foundation that seems pretty close 
though in our next stages is to make uh, many added details and corrections and work on the likeness of the Countess and try uh, refine her features and make the resemblance a bit stronger. Overall, a, a greater refinement. And speaking of refinement, uh, we should now talk about a refined artist, Jean-Auguste Dominique Angre, who was born in 1780 in Montalban, a town in the southern uh, part of France, close to Spain. He was the eldest of seven children, and despite the seven children, his mother and father were not particularly fond of each other and lived apart much of the time. Uh, young Jean Ang was raised mostly by his father, who was something of a jack-of-all-trades, and taught his son the rudiments of art and music. The boy proved very talented and became a very good violinist who played at a highly professional level. Even more so, he became an outstanding artist. Here's a chalk portrait he, uh, young Ang did when he was 17. So it was determined that the boy would travel to the big city of Paris and try his luck as a professional artist. There are stories that he supported himself by playing the violin as he made his laborious way north up to Paris. Now, the French painting of this time period was dominated by works that were light and colorful and charming and gracious and carefree, and this style was called the Rococo and was a reflection of the taste of the French court. That is what they liked to see, uh, not the real world, but a reflection of themselves. But as we know now, there was tremendous unrest in the country in the days of King Louis XVI and Queen Marie Antoinette were numbered, and the French Revolution was coming. The artist most associated with the French Revolution was Jacques-Louis David, and his mature work rejected the court frivolity and concentrated on reviving heroic dramas from the Greek and Roman history, dealing with liberty and loyalty and democracy. Uh, this style was called neoclassical. Also, David was an important figure and supporter of the revolution, and he did a famous propaganda portrait of the revolutionary leader Marat, who was assassinated while taking a bath, and David made him look like an ancient classical hero who had fallen on the battlefield. There were big changes in all levels of society, too. The surviving aristocratic ladies, uh, who then rejected the uh, previous era's uh, big, fluffy, poofy dresses, and for a time, embraced much simpler fashions, like form-fitting tunics that imitated ancient Greek and Roman way of dressing. And since an artist has to earn a living, David painted some of these society ladies in their new neoclassical dresses. This portrait, the figure is by David, but the couch and the lampstand here are painted by his assistant and pupil, the young Jean Angre, who is now 19 years old and part of David's workshop studio. Uh, David, like a lot of revolutionaries, became a supporter of Napoleon. And here's David's dramatic depiction of Napoleon leading his troops through the mountains. Ang, once he left David and struck out on his own, uh, when David won better and showed a life-size portrait of Napoleon as a mighty emperor, almost godlike, seated on an imperial throne. It wasn't much of a stretch when Ang showed his interest in classic mythological themes when he depicted a scene from Homer's Iliad with the great king of the gods Jupiter enthroned in Olympus with a nymph named Thetis begging Jupiter to spare her son Achilles in the Trojan War. This is a striking painting, it's 10 feet tall, and Ang's obviously a young, ambitious artist. An, another mythological painting that he did was Oedipus solving the riddle of the Sphinx. Uh, you see that he's a master of anatomy and mood. Uh, this is a very famous painting. Sigmund Freud had a copy of this painting on the wall of his office near, his, near the couch. Uh, Freud uh, liked the symbolism of solving the secrets of the psyche. So, so um, Ang is obviously an ambitious young talent. 
And here's a self-portrait he made when he was 24 years old. He's a guy with a great future, and he had just won an important scholarship from the French government called the Prix de Rome, which allows the recipient to travel and live and study in Rome and Italy and study especially the uh, great Italian masters of, um, of painting and architecture. It's all funded by the government. But once he was there, there came a shift in the government and there were cutbacks and he lost his state funding. So for a while, for several years, he had to live as a hand in mouth sort of existence as a sketch artist doing quick chalk and graphite um, sketches of various people in Rome, mainly tourists, British tourists at that. And he made his living like that for several years, and he came to dislike the work. Uh, he thought it was demeaning. It kept him away from doing important work. He began to hate doing portraits, even though many of these drawings are priceless. They're very beautifully done and give us a real feel for the, uh, and character of these uh, 19th century people. But uh, what he wanted really was to have commissions for big, important, quote-unquote, works of historic import. Uh, here's one uh, from this time that combines history and religion called The Vow of Louis XIII, an altarpiece that combined 17th century French king pledging his all to the Virgin Mary and child, and a direct tribute to the Renaissance painter Raphael, who the artist that Ang admired and loved above all others. This painting was a great success at the time, and Ang was eventually able to divide his time teaching and painting between Paris and Italy. And while working on another ancient Greek history themed painting, Ang was visited by, in a studio by a young French diplomat, the Viscount d'Ossonville, and his pretty wife Louise. And while everyone noticed that by coincidence, Louise bore a resemblance to the classic heroine of Ang's painting, and it was informally agreed that the artist should indeed paint an official po portrait of the lady. The room where my personal computer is, and we're going to help, that's going to help us work on the painting, as it's such as it is right now, and um, one of the great um, tools for using um, paintings is Wikipedia. They have a, a, a really nice ability for uh, you can read about the painting and the people involved, but also um, you can click on the images and it will give you an enlargement. One enlargement and then clicking on it again you get a super big enlargement and you can see the painting in uh, very uh, excruciating details and if you get a really close look we can see now her hair how her hair is tied up in the folds and the ribbon in her hair and that that uh, comb that's probably tortoise shell and there's her pretty face and here's um, the frame of the mirror we can see all the little uh, knobs and decorations on that, the tassel, the uh, color of the wall in the mirror, uh, her arms, and the um, her jewelry, that bracelet, and also the ring. We'll talk a little bit about more about that ring later, and the um, mantle where um, she's got vases and flowers, and the decoration on the flower vase. You can see she's got calling cards from visitors in the back. There's the fringe on the cloth on the mantle. And also, here we are, that dress. Oi, 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 that dress. What have I gotten myself into? It is um, uh, quite a work in itself. And Ang devoted a lot of attention to the um, folds and uh, ridges of the dress and it makes it gives a picture sort of like a certain motion involved but I'll go to our next phase of the painting and trying 
get a more of a refine our image, try and get more of a likeness. And using um, just very pale gray and also white, we're going to uh, I'm going to uh, redo her face. Um, if you notice, um, I had in my drawing had given her a much more prominent nose. That helps me just anchor her face, anchor her lips and her eyes. But now, as we're doing it, we're um, Ang had de-emphasized the nose, just like modern makeup artists today for women, they uh, de-emphasize the nose and emphasize the eyes and lips, which is what I'm going to work on now. And uh, let's see, I'm just removing the outlines of the nose, uh, highlighting all the little um, highlights areas in the cheeks, the tip of the nose, in the lips. sort of like you're carving a picture using your whites and just little black accents shortening up the nose again see now the nose is starting to become less prominent more subtle the eyes are going to be worked on and the eyelids and the eyebrows the shadow created by the ridge of the eyebrows and the slight shadow that's caused by the upper eyelid over the uh, irises. These are all things that have to be looked at. Little highlights and such shadows. Uh, though this is not a heavily shadowed picture, unlike, say, a Rembrandt or a Caravaggio. The other uh, video I talked about um, things like uh, Chiaroscuro, which is about how something emerges out of shadow. This isn't so much shadows, though we are going to work on a shadow under the nose. Just that little shadow under the nose gives her, defines her nose more than the nose itself, the bridge. Now, using acrylic white, you can just do highlights. Just get edges. I'm working on her fingers now and hands. Go going to give her now a ring on her finger, a little wedding ring that's there. And uh, just working on just the um, knuckles of her hand, the sides, and use, again, using the white as the highlight of the area. The gray areas that were formerly in uh, are going to fade in and become the modeling of the shadow there on the neck. It's amazing how just a little millimeter, little blot can change the character of someone's face in a painting, someone's um, character, but we... Um, muddle through on that so i think we're making some progress here but the best way of looking sometimes is looking in a mirror and looking at the backward image of the, the sea where we are going wrong what we are getting right and things that aren't obvious to us that are obvious to other eyes uh, can be um, make themselves known so Using um, a tape, I'm going just to just to work on the details of the left side of her face, and uh, or her right side, but my left, and uh, just the little accents, little accents of white, little accents of black or near brown, a uh, near gray rather, um, give a, 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 it a more uh, sculptured look. Now do the other side of the face. It's interesting how if you split someone's face down the middle, how one side of the face can look very different than the other side of the face. We're working on her hair, putting little details of the hair, and try making her eyes look alive. Just a tiny dot of highlight of uh, reflected light. Now, I'm going to look at those, uh, those um, big milky arms of hers. Uh, I realize I've made a mistake in, um, but not a mistake, but I'm just making a correction now uh, that I made the arms a little too plump and I'm giving, uh, thinning it down and showing a little more bone and muscle in her arms. Got a secret to tell that um, Ang liked ar uh, plump arms on his ladies and often asked his models to um, bear wear dresses that would bear their arms uh, so he could have fun painting them. Now, uh, 
The pose in the original painting that caught everyone's eye was um, inspired by ancient classical statues, and that's echoed in the pose that the Countess Louise is striking in her portrait. Now, Louise, now, Louise de Broglier was from an important family of aristocrats and intellectuals. Her grandmother was perhaps the most renowned female writer and philosopher of her time, known as the Madame de Stahl, a woman whose political writings so angered Napoleon that it led to her banishment from France. Granddaughter Louise was also highly intelligent and was a gifted author and artist in her own right, and Ang was in fact dissatisfied with his first attempt to portray her, thinking it missed her inner life and spirit. So he tried again, making dozens and dozens of preliminary drawings, studying and reworking and recomposing, until he had a final composition that satisfied him, and all the elements, the dress, the face, the mantle, were all working together. We are fortunate that we have these preparatory drawings, they reveal how Aang methodically agonized and labored and reworked details until they all pleased him. But Louise herself wasn't always pleased and sometimes lost patience with all this laborious and just plain boring posing. She wrote in a letter, For the last nine days, Aang has been painting one of my hands. Well, let's take a look at the hand now. And uh, beautiful hand it is. And she is wearing that ring. It's a golden turquoise ring. It's called a Cleopatra ring because it's in the shape of a snake. And supposedly Cleopatra uh, allowed a, a snake to bite her and cause her death. And uh, the bracelet is also gold and turquoise, which matches her dress and her eyes too, as a matter of fact. So I'm going to work a little bit here on the, uh, on the bracelet and also on the ring. Uh, as he worked, Aang still felt something elusive about his model. Uh, he knew there was an intelligence, but also an unhappiness. Her memoirs were very revealing. She wrote, I was destined to beguile, to attract, to seduce, and in the final reckoning, to cause suffering in all those who sought their happiness in me. We're back again looking at our silk dress and uh, just studying it some more. It's, it is a marvel. A uh, great deal of variety of shapes and, uh, and the, the lighting of patterns. Uh, some people have said that the dress itself has more life than the uh, model. I don't believe that myself, but it has been said. The, um, so the best thing, we're, I'm not spending a whole lot of time studying the grid anymore, but just looking at the painting and, and, and the different sh shapes. The uh, best is to look at it as abstract shapes and, the, and rhythms and the uh, areas that are closest to the viewer are going to be catching the light and they're going to be in white and the areas that recede the valleys in the dress will be darker and dark grays and near black and just touching it's not flat like the skin color can be it is because of um, the many folds and uh, just the type of material it is it will uh, we just uh, hit little accents little bangs of uh, white and dark and so I'm just going to work on this for a while with my uh, new store-bought um, paintbrush. Uh, still has the uh, sales tag on it. Uh, two for one sale, I believe. All told, it took Aang three years to complete this painting. He didn't work on it continuously, though. Uh, he had other projects. 
and he also had dry spells when he groaned about doing portraits at all. And also Louise herself uh, was busy. Um, she had a child during this period and also traveled with her husband on his diplomatic trips. Uh, in her absence, Ang could still work on the dress by displaying it on a dressmaker's dummy. He also could uh, work on the various um, uh, accessories uh, of the, uh, in the room. And that's what we'll work on now. Um, got masking tape helps me keep uh, straight lines. Though, to be honest, I didn't uh, get too so straight a line over here. But I can correct it. And I'm just working on the studs on the mantle there. I'll also work on the uh, on the fringe. Yep, right over there, fringe. I'm going to work now on the uh, flowers on the uh, on the mantle now. They actually are a little confusing because they are, they are the flowers that are on the mantle and then there's the reflection of the uh, flowers in the mirror. They're a little grayer. So what what's the actual flower and what's the reflection? It's a little, not always easy to tell. But I will gamely plow, plow forward. When, when I get a little tired of this, I can also go to another area of the painting and work on that. Having grown a little tired of working on the flowers, I'm now going to work on the vase, which is a French porcelain, and it is um, mounted and decorated with um, metallic decorations uh, called Ormalu, which was uh, sculpted bronze and then was given a coating of uh, mercury and gold leaf, and then it was subjected to heat and then the mercury would evaporate and the gold leaf would remain adhered to the um, to the bronze problem with that is that the mercury even uh, was is poisonous and hurt people who were using that system so eventually they figured out a way of doing it without the mercury the little indentations and shadows that are in the armalu and in the decorations are accents of black and little highlights of white get the little bumps nooks and crannies next to the vase on the mantle there is a tassel and this tassel is connected to a rope that is connected to a bell and when a master of the house wanted to be served they'd pull on that rope which would ring a bell and summon a butler or a maid to come back on those uh, flowers again uh, making them a little more definite darker also working on the flower pot uh, now the um, wall molding the paneling the wainscoting the um, masking tape is very valuable for that as is um, the rulers to keep um, our lines um, straight and well spaced and controlled. When um, looking at these, uh, if you can look at them on a mirror backwards, it's helpful. Or even not, you can just turn the painting upside down, which is what I'm going to do now, to take a look to see if these uh, straight lines and these panels are, uh, are indeed straight and seem to be uh, in proportion and adjustable and uh, that's what I'm working on now is adjusting them they look a little crooked to me but they'll look 
I'll improve them and refine them as I go along. The, the masking tape is very valuable and helpful when you're making straight lines and molding, which is what I'm doing here. And now that we've got the uh, indicated the wall molding, we can now refine that and add highlights onto it, uh, straighten the lines, make the lines more refined and thinner as we go along. And now it's time to uh, attack that uh, the mirror frame over here and also the bell rope again using the tape setting our lines and again uh, again I'm talking about accents sharp little patches of dark and light that give the illusion of dimension and texture give the uh, all those little decorations, little lumpy little uh, little uh, tchotchkes on the edge of the uh, mirror frame there. Again, using this just to refine our lines here. And uh, here's the gas light. Uh, I'm particularly fond of this little gas light up here, this little sconce, which was attached to a piping in the wall, and it's a fairly new invention. Uh, still in the 1840s, as you can get light coming in your house, which was an improvement over your, over candles. So it would come out with coal gas that was you could ignite. There's reflection of the uh, gas light in the mirror. Now, the border over there and the um, bell rope now have be are in there, but they become a little too definite, a little too strong, so I'm going to tone them down, grade them down a little bit. I'll bring them up with some highlights, but I don't want them to compete so much with the image of Our Lady. Firm up the uh, edge of the mirror here. And now to the, um, using some more white, a little white there. And going over the um, um, decorations that I've already highlighted earlier before with white, but now I'm go I tone them down and going back over them again, and that gives an even greater uh, illusion of depth. Not hitting it all exactly the same way, just giving it a little less, but that uh, that uh, gives it a little more um, uh, volume and texture. Now we're on the upholstery. We're in the home stretch, folks. We're um, just working on the upholstery of the chair. And uh, later on, we can see that this is not all upholstery. There's also a uh, yellow uh, shawl that is uh, kind of uh, casually draped over the chair. And that will show up when we add color. Right now, we're just refining our shapes. If you looked at the beginning of this video, you can see that from tiny acorns, mighty oaks grow. Uh, we've come a long way. Uh, we now, well, it still has some refinement to do. Uh, we've got now a pretty finished grisaille uh, painting of the... Uh, uh, the Comtesse d'Ossonville of Ang. Now our next step is to add color to the painting through the glaze method. But in the meantime, I'm taking a break and in the tradition of these videos, I'm having lunch. Uh, a French lunch, I believe. It's a croissant and fromage. Cheese. See you later. Hope you come back. Hopefully I can lip sync better too. <laughs>